Welcome back to another episode of The Bourbon Lens, and this is not just any other episode. This is episode 200, so we want to say thank you to all of our listeners for the last 199 episodes and you turning into this 200th. Uh, it means a lot to Scott and I as we've put a lot of time, work, and effort into this, and we're thankful for this guest because this guest is big and bold as it is for our 200, as it is for those people that are going to get to try this along the way. So today we are joined by Rebecca Jago, Managing Director of The Last Drop Distillers, and Drew Mayville, who is the Master Blender and Director of Quality at Sazerac. So Rebecca and Drew, thanks for joining the Bourbon Lens. Thank, Thank you for having, for having us. us. So it's it's big. It's, it's a big time for you all as uh, the, the latest release, Last Drop 28, is about to release or is has already released into the market. And, and it's, it's the busy time of whiskey is what I like to say this is, right? The, the clock turns from September to October and every release comes out in a, in a hurry. And so no different than for you all. So when you think about this release and just getting into the holidays and the seasons, what's it like to, to get this out during that busy time in whiskey? Well, I think if I'm being completely honest, we would have liked it to be a little sooner just because there's been so much anticipation and excitement around the release and and obviously we we've, we've been talking about it for slightly longer than than we might otherwise have done so um but i think for me and i hope drew agrees with this this is not the sort of this is not the sort of release that's going to disappear into into a sort of mass of other Christmassy holiday season releases, partly because there's so little of it and partly because there's so much anticipation for this. You know, having a combination of an American whiskey moment and one of the supreme stars of the world of American whiskey creating it means that we have a very easy job. Let's say, you know, if sometimes it's harder to open doors and sometimes the doors just fly open for you. And I think we've got one of those with my friend Drew for this one. So I'm not I'm not personally very worried about being crowded out by other people. Yeah, I think that's big. And and you know, Drew, as you mentioned, is is a large person in whiskey and he works with an iconic brand doing a lot of different things, um, who have a lot of releases going on right now. But this is an ultra mm-hmm. premium spirit, right? This is not just your everyday LTO, that's, you know, a couple hundred dollars. This is a, an elevated spirit. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, since you pulled us into Drew, you know, Drew, for the people who don't know you, right? Sometimes people don't know the people making the whiskey and blending the whiskey behind the scenes. And Rebecca said this, we're not going to shine the light on her. We will get to her in a minute. We will shine the light on you for a second, Drew. So can you tell us and tell our listeners a little bit about what your role is and how you got into whiskey because it's it's a decorated 40 year career so i'm i'm a synopsis of your thesis statement if you don't mind well i thought you said we only had 30 minutes uh, <laughs> so i hope your your synopsis is is all 30 of it then it's all good <laughs> no no it's i i'm like rebecca i i prefer not to talk about myself um but uh in saying that uh my my career spans over 40 years in the industry and I uh, started out with a company uh, called Seagram and ended up becoming the master blender for Seagram in North America and spent a few years with Diageo. And uh, almost 20 years ago now, I left uh, Diageo to come to Buffalo Trace Distillery. And, that, you know, you say iconic um, in, in terms of Buffalo Trace Distillery back in uh, 20 years ago, it certainly was far from being iconic at the time. So we were really a distillery that was really not uh, well established, at least uh, not in terms of recognition. And today we're probably one of the most famous distilleries uh, on the planet. And that's to me uh, a sign of all the hard work that everybody puts in on the team at Buffalo Trace Distillery. Uh, and, you know, and there's a lot of people, mind you, that that includes, including uh, the master distiller Harlan Wheatley. So a lot goes into that. But my career through uh, all these years has become the master blender. Uh, not that I started out that way, at least uh, not wanting to be that at the orig- originally. But over the years, I've become that, and that's where I am now. So it actually fits in nicely with what we're going to talk about today with this brand and how much of a dream it was for me to create something like this after all these years of. Uh, blending in the, in the industry. 
Yeah. And, and I think that's what's, you know, you say that really interestingly, 20 years ago, Buffalo Trace wasn't what it is today. And over the years, I like to say this is become the master marketer. They have created the hype and the the journey for people to want to be a part of the experience, whether that is regular Buffalo Trace all the way to their LTOs, right? There's a variety of spirits that have created that. And um, good on you all for knowing that, hey, this is, this is a growth and a development piece of that pie. Uh, and so that's, that's what's exciting about it is that this is just another step in the direction of, of creating, you know, that experience around the Buffalo Trace products and that you all have put in market. Yeah, I would, I would add to that just saying the marketing is brilliant, but uh, more importantly, the products we have speak more than volume. We have the greatest quality products, mm. in my opinion. So, if you know, I don't want to diminish that part of the uh, marketing can only do so much, but maybe people will buy it the first time, but after they they taste it the second time um, to buy it again. Uh, that's where all the product taste comes in and the yeah. quality. No, that makes that makes that makes all the the sense in the world and, and the betterment of it, right? Because I, how many Buffalo Trace products do I have on my my shelf? Quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's great. Yeah, um, and so you know, getting into this, you know, experience, uh, we would be doing ourselves a disservice before we talked about the liquid. If we didn't just highlight Rebecca a smidge. Um, and so, um, this is, this is a unique, right. And what you all are creating, it's not unique necessarily to, for a lot of people getting single barrels and blending houses, right. That that's more common in, in, in English, uh, spirits than it is in the States. Right. And so creating these ultra premium experiences, what's that like to you to work with the best of the best, having the best of the best liquid to really produce the last drop experience for world whiskey tasters uh, and, and enthusiasts around the world? I think if you talk to Drew and some of the other members of our assembly, including Richard, who you mentioned earlier, and the wonderful Colin Scott, who is our Scotch whiskey master blender, then each of the ones that I've spoken to about cre the creation of liquids for the last drop will talk about the fact that this is like a moment in heaven, because if you've worked in a commercial environment as a, as a master blender, then you know that your job as much as anything else is to create consistency and quality. But very often you're working to a specific brief. And what we did with Colin and what we also asked Drew to do, um, and I'll, I'll come back to, to the the blending program in a bit more detail was to do something that was entirely what they wanted to do. So my only brief to Drew was make, make what you want to make, make the thing that would make you proud. And so it's a very different role from the one of consistency and ensuring that, that what you're making is as good as the last batch or the same as the last batch. So I think there's a, a real sort of pleasure principle here, which is that we're asking people to work with the best and to to make the best because they are the best, if you like. You know, Drew and Colin and, and Richard are all, you know, titans, if you like. They're they're like the top of their they're the top of their industry. And that's so so I would say that if we're going to talk about me for a bit, which we're not, but if we were, then I would say that I am I'm just this extraordinarily privileged person to be in the in the room with these people because I I and I'm not being falsely modest here, I didn't really do anything to have the job I have except to be my father's daughter. And my father was the co-founder of The Last Drop, and and I joined the business and have have acquired the some of the experience but also the title that but my job is to carry on what he and James Espy started and to work with people who can ensure that that our products continue to be as stellar as the original releases were so I'm like um I'm like a what's the word caretaker that's the word I'm looking for um and the and the other part of my job is obviously to tell the stories behind those those bottles and to allow both the bottles and the creators in the case of Drew and others to speak for themselves. So 
I hope that goes some way towards answering your question. Very much so. I, I think it, it's important to know that, you know, there is someone that is shepherding this along, right? Um, every great team needs a quarterback, a coach, captain, whatever it is. And you're, you're kind of riding that ship. Um, and, and that's what's important is not only is it important to you now, but it's important to the legacy that you're creating in whiskey, yeah. right? And you could tell and how sincere you were about that and carrying on the legacy of your, your father and, and his fa- co-founder. And like, that's huge because whiskey is about telling a story just as Drew created a story by blending this whiskey and that people will enjoy. You're creating a story year in or year out, depending on how much liquid you have for people to enjoy that experience. Oh, totally. And, and I think I love what I really love all the words you use because the two things I feel really strongly about amongst many others are a, that it's the, the telling the story and the story of both the brand of my father, of James, but also of the liquids that we put into bottles is half, is half the, the work, if you like. And the other half is the enjoyment factor, because I think Drew and I are both passionate advocates of the whiskey was made to be drunk, not to be shut away in a cupboard, never to see the light of day. It wasn't intended to be an investment by anybody ever. And so those are my two, those are my real passions is to to carry on the, the legacy, to build on that and to and to to encourage people, even at this very elevated price point, to find that special occasion and share these liquids with their nearest and dearest and make their own memories. Yeah, I, I said before that Rebecca is modest, but um, besides, um, I, in my opinion, besides um, what you just mentioned, I think vision is very important. And I think she has, she's carried on the vision, what she has, because we, at, I think at last drop, we're really curators of these liquids, finding them around the world. And I think we're making that tradition or that transition from curators to creators and both basically. And I think vision is just as important as, um, you know, the legacy of what started out as last drop and how we get to the future. So I just like to add that piece of it. Well, you put it perfectly, Drew, of course. So I think I think and I think that's worth just just talking a little bit about is exactly what Drew was talking about, the the transition we're making. Um we touched before we started recording about uh, on the assembly and really um when Colin Scott retired from Shivers Brothers, uh, that was the catalyst for us to ask Colin, Drew, Richard, and three others to join an assembly, which would be a very informal group of real experts who would lend their knowledge and their expertise to to our assessment of the the, the liquids we were bottling. But with the advent or the creation of the assembly there was suddenly this opportunity to have a real hand in in sort of forming our own or shaping our own future to to not just be dependent on what we found but also to ask each of them to become an author if you like and to tell their own story through their experience and through the liquids they put together for us and i think the enthusiasm that each of them has greeted that concept with and the the two that we've so far brought to market are the most beautiful expressions of that passion and that creativity so so yes i mean i'm not claiming i'm not claiming the credit but it is it, it the creation of the formation of the assembly was an incredibly incredibly proud moment for the last drop and i hope for drew colin richard and the others well, and so, you know, getting into that, right. And, and I want to talk about the art of, of blending these delicate spirits, right? Because you're working with, we don't know the exact age, but we're, you're working with aged spirits. So you're going to have a lot less to work with, right? Out, Angel Share has taken care of a lot of it. Thanks to, you know, just the way America's terrain is and, and the whiskey that you're working with. Um, you know, for me, I sat down with mine before I left for Barbados and, I let my wife smell my whiskey from time to time. And she was like, Hey, I was like, Hey, this is the most expensive, expensive, like sample of whiskey I've ever gotten in my life. 
honest to God. And I was like, hey, smell this. Like, what do you think? And she pulled out a note that I would have never smelled that I thought was super interesting. There's like a toasted coconut on it. And that I kept getting coming back to that as a, a note that I really enjoyed in the whiskey. Um, but the rich oak, but there's also rich, bright orchard fruits for me and baking spices. Um, but the toasted coconut was the most unique thing from just a nose pers- perspective. Um, and I'm not going to go through my, my palate. I'll let Scott speak, but those were the, just kind of the general tasting notes that I got. And I, and I'll, we'll read through or Drew, we'll let you talk about, you know, the tasting notes that you you've kind of come up with, but Scott, like, what did you get just on the nose? Yeah, I mean, immediately I'm just hit with like a burst of like cherries and like fruit and yeah. it's just, it kind of just jumps out of the glass. So, you know, and I had some, Yesterday, I actually had some cherry cobbler, and that's what this reminds me of. It's just that, like that baked cherry, with like that breadiness, that doughiness, with like a little bit of cinnamon. And it's just, I mean, to me, like if you put this in my glass and didn't tell me where it came from, I would be like, "Well, the, damn, this tastes like it came from Buffalo Trace." And I think that's kind of the the beauty of it is that's what it should, you know, that's what it should be. It it should taste like it came from the place where it came from. Yeah, if, you, um, if you've been to Buffalo Trace, you can walk into our warehouses and this is what you smell is that beautiful old uh, warehouse smell with that whiskey in the air. Mm. Um, at least I, it reminds me of that. Very. Yeah, I almost get like walking into like a humidor, like in a cigar, like a cigar shop. Like it's that that woodiness, that perfumey like cedar wood. Oh, yes. So when you say like walking into a warehouse, I mean. Yeah, I could I could get that like that dried wood that you know, probably a little bit of musty mustiness from moisture and things like that. But yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, the way it was blended was it's really um, it, it's an important part of of what you're smelling, and it's it's more of a, a celebration of the three different types of whiskeys that went into it because it's it's a a blend of Kentucky straight. Uh, whiskeys and that includes wheat uh, bourbon rye bourbon and uh, straight rye so what i've tried to do is give you the best of all of those and i think to me that was my dream of doing this is giving you something that you'll never be able to taste again that's so unique and the sum is really better than the individual parts and as a blender uh, i think that's what blenders would uh, actually dream of of having the opportunity to do exactly what I've just done, at least through my whole career, I've been dreaming of this, um, where there's no restrictions. I basically have the whiskeys because I had a choice of over 40 different uh, vintage whiskeys that I put away over the last 20 years. And this is what I ended up with, which I thought was uh, better than the individual components. Each component could stand alone and you could actually go and sell that and people would enjoy it very much. But I believe it's better uh, when it's blended because I can really dictate the taste profile based on the blending that I've done. Mm. So so tell us a little bit about how that works uh, as master blender at Buffalo Trace. You say you put away whiskeys for years. Yes. Did yes. you just kind of roll them to a special place in, in the rickhouse that no one else knew about and that you were just going to kind of quietly monitor? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, I probably got in trouble uh, if if someone found out at one point. But basically, anything <laughs> when I when I thought something was pretty special, I put it away. And so these are older whiskeys. These are not something that were just uh, brought out. So they've been sitting around. They're vintage whiskeys. So in other words, when these when these uh, barrels are gone, it's it. There's no more left. So that's kind of the exclusivity and the customization here is that we basically have only select amounts and it allows me actually to uh, blend the these different components. So some of them are completely gone now, so they'll never be replaced. So it is truly a one of a kind uh, blend that I thought turned out pretty remarkable. So speaking to that, right, from the, the blending experience, you have these 40 some odd barrels set back and you're, you're choosing from these. How do you go to even begin that process? This is like the, the art of the mad scientist, right? Because you have infinite possibilities 
right? It, right. Really at, at your fingertips on how you could create this. So like, what's the first step? Because for me, like I'm thinking, and I'm just like, that's really overwhelming. Like it was overwhelming when I had four samples to try to blend. So like 40 makes it sound my, my head just kind of almost combusted <laughs> as I thought. The, the best part of it is that you get to taste all these. Mm. That's the best part. Yeah. Uh, so, so here, here, the, the start of this process was basically sampling these whiskeys, tasting them, and then deciding which ones to work with. And that's basically what I did based on my vision of the celebration of these different mash bills that I wanted to achieve. And then what it comes down to is narrowing that down so that the balance and the flavor profile is exactly what I want. And that's where that uh, iterations of dozens and dozens of blends that comes up because it took lots of trials before I got to where I thought was perfect. Mm. And so speaking back to the assembly, does does anyone like kind of speak into that with Drew or is it Drew or you by yourself creating this this blend? So Rebecca, like how does that work like from your all's perspective? Oh, so I think that um, we haven't yet got to the point where we're talking about um, cross category blends. I think we've got six amazing people who are each ready and willing to, to create something which speaks to their category. Mm. Um, so it really was as simple as we 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 want to create a sort of annual calendar of releases which which combines both the curation and the creation and really that was formalized this year with with Drew's blend so mm. Drew's will be the large fall creation and then in the spring of 2023 we'll create we'll will release it could be three or four much smaller bottlings which could be as few as 60 20 30 40 bottles and as many as maybe two three hundred and they will be the collection of interesting spirits from across the categories mm. and um so when we when we formed the assembly and when i asked colin and then drew to create something for us it was y- your expertise your playground your category and I suppose when we first started this, we talked about it being a bourbon blend. And then when Drew got got going, it was clear that this was this was not going to be a straight bourbon blend. It was going to be something that is both more interesting and also more unusual than than simply a bourbon. And in fact, we haven't had any sort of resistance to the description, have we, Drew? No. No. So it's a blend of Kentucky straight whiskies, mm. which we're aware, you know, there are there are some connotations around the word blended whiskey that that are not necessarily positive ones. But I think when you've got something that that is as good as this, that speaks for itself and speaks of its its author, then that's not a not an issue that we have to face. Because I just, everyone... want, I just wanted to mention though this. It never everything I've done here was never start. It never started out to be a last drop product. I didn't know what it was going to be, which is really kind of uh, speaks volumes for Buffalo Trace and Sazerac. Is yeah, I had an idea, and um, is are you still there? I think I've yeah. seen. Okay, I had an idea back many years ago when I first started at Buffalo Trace that um, we. You know, I could take these different components at some point and blend and make some products. Uh, We hadn't uh, purchased uh, the last drop to story back in those days, but I was given the opportunity to set aside whiskeys for the future. And then this opportunity came up in working in partnership with Rebecca and actually uh, gave it a venue to actually come out with an actual product, which is really great. And so, like I said, from the beginning, it wasn't for last drop. It was to set aside some of the best whiskeys, the vintage whiskeys that I that I liked, that someday I knew, you know, as a blender, uh, I'll be able to blend something that will be truly, truly remarkable and unforgettable for our customers. And or is a really cool. or is a really nice retirement gift to yourself, right? <laughs> Well, I don't plan on retiring, so no. I don't know about oh, well, that. That. <laughs> he's not allowed. He's, he's got to make another one now. Um, I, I've been working for forty-two years in the industry, and I haven't worked a day. Can't complain about that. 
I think it, it's worth noting that uh, that so, something that's a really sort of lovely piece of synergy around what what we've got here today is that Drew had the idea for this look before the last drop even came into existence because we were only my dad and James only founded the business in 2008 and Drew had been harboring this vision and this idea and indeed the liquids to which which became part of what he he used to create his blend before we even were in existence but i i i think that um both James and my dad would both be completely delighted with where we've ended up in in terms of the evolution of the business i think they would take they would see it as a very logical step but the first conversation that drew and i had about this was very much that sort of well i've been waiting for somebody to ask me to do this for the last however many years so it's a sort of perfect meeting of minds if you like yeah, I find it really interesting. And I also find it interesting that, um, you know, a lot of times the iconic Buffalo Trace mash bill, the weeded one, right, is the one that kind of comes to the forefront. But I love the fact that the rye mash bill is in here mm-hmm. because I think when you think about Kentucky style rye whiskeys, just in general, the Buffalo Trace mash bill for their rye is, is the m- more unique one of of the Kentucky style rye uh, mantras, right? It's not 95.5. I don't know what it is, but I, I know, I know I've drank enough MGP to know what 95.5 is. And I know mm-hmm. I've drank enough, you know, 51% rye whiskey to know what Kentucky style, right? And like, it kind of sits in between. And so I think adding that into that, that level of complexity that that can bring forward, that's the baking spice, that spiciness that comes from that rye really garners and balances out the, the profile of the whiskey to me. Cause knowing that's in there, like I'm going to like logically look for some spicy notes and, and the baking spices are subtle, but they spike at the right time because it's a wave of flavor, not through, not just through your nose, but through your palate as well. And like, mm-hmm. that's the journey that I liked most about this was the journey across my palate from the beginning to the end, because it hit all the sensory factors across the palate, not just up front or in the back with the tannin. It kind of hit all over. And I think that's what was beautifully crafted and the rye spice balanced it out for me. Wow, you just described my vision on what I wanted to do with this. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm here, you know, I'm here all get, week for can, pro bono. You can, actually, you can actually taste the different whiskeys, the wheat being really soft up front. And as you described the journey across your palate, it transitions to that leather baking spice yeah. and the crescendo really of the chocolate, the oak and uh, the vanilla flavor. So all those elements are all there, but layers of flavor and complexity. And that was the whole idea to give you that sophisticated, restrained, but balanced, but an unforgettable sensory experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I was on the same page because I just wrote, you know, I because I like to write not not so much tasting notes, but just about how it how it feels you, when you're drinking it, the experience, like what Jake was alluding to. But sweet on the tip of the tongue was just it was just sugary sweet, but then as it like like lingers, it just turns into that that rye toasty, like cinnamon. Almost I wrote cinnamon rye toast. Like if if you were having breakfast and you. And instead of using regular toast, you just use some rye bread and maybe sprinkled some cinnamon on it. That's what I, I kind of was left with. But after getting that s- super sweetness up front. Mm. Yeah. But it's also the sweetness is, is it, to me, it's counteracted by the rye spiciness, yep. the bitter sweetness, the, the unrelenting oak and dark chocolate. It's all balanced there. And I want it really, really to be unforgettable that you when you when you taste it, you'll say, gee. I have never tasted that before. And the other thing is you'll never taste it again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the the drying effect at the very end, right? It's a yeah. palate like sucker because it takes all your flavors and morsels away. It's like there's just that dark, chocolatey, bitter drying effect at the end, I thought was literally the crescendo of the whiskey. Because yeah. a lot of times when you have all this oak tannin from these whiskeys sitting around for a variety of years – it just right. punches your esophagus like, yes. and you're just like, ah, the Kentucky hug as it's well known uh, here. Right. Like that's really kind of non-existent because it, the finish as it's supposed to be is on the palate. Like yeah. when we think of dusty whiskeys, you finish on the palate, you don't finish in your, in your heartburn uh, that you get later. Um, and this 
is a palette finisher, just dark, drying chocolate and bitterness. And like, that's what I, I think was the crescendo for me. And like, I, I didn't get it at first because the oak tannin was a little much for my palate. Cause I didn't prime my palate, which I should have. Um, but the oak tannin and then and the fresh berries and, and the rye and the spice and all those things. And then that second drink. And then that just kind of yes. leaving there. I was like, this is yes. beautifully done. Yeah. I always tell people wait after the first before you make an assessment because the second is where you start to taste it. Yep. And then after the fifth and sixth sip, boy, you really get it. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. And uh, I left it uncut, unfiltered, too. I should mention that because uh, at 121.4 proof, it uh, really allows all those fatty acids and esters to stick to your palate and, and linger after the fact. And I think that really uh, not only adds to the complexity and the balance, but uh, amplifies the flavor profile. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know I said I've had the perfect whiskey. But this, from a bourbon perspective, this is getting pretty close. Like having bourbon part of it, it's getting pretty close. Like it was really masterfully done. And I'm not saying that to hype it up. I just honestly think that at 120 plus proof, you couldn't tell. It, it drank like a delicate scotch that was an 85, 86 with all the depth and complexity to it at 120 plus wow. proof. And like that's what I – this is probably one of the closest to perfect that I would say. And I well, think you, that that's what comes with the, the work and the years of experience that goes along with it. Yeah. Well, I, your viewers can't see me, but I'm actually blushing right now. So my face <laughs> is kind of red. <laughs> You're um, very nice. But you know what, what I really hope is that people out there actually have a chance to taste this and uh, enjoy it and savor it because it's something that once, once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, there's no more left. So it's it truly is rare. Drop. Yes. It is the last drop. Yeah. And again, I, I'm, we like to be true. We try to be super transparent and honest and, and I'm just really, I was blown away by, by the whiskey and I, and no, I didn't no. know, you. you know, what to, to expect. And this is my kind of like last question around this is because, you know, in, in England and in Scotland, like this is, this is not unique, right? Like ultra premium whiskeys, there's hundreds of them cause they're 80, 90 years old. Just pick a brand. Right. Um, and so getting into that category, I was worried at first that they would be like, well, bourbon's not old enough. It doesn't have enough to carry this. Like when you all put this together, was that ever uh, a thought process? Like, hey, we're going against these ultra premium world whiskeys, Scotch, Irish, whatever. How is this bourbon or, you know, stateside whiskey going to, you know, approach the international market? Did that ever cross your mind? Is this going to be a hard sell? Or was like, hey, we know that this established market is there and there's going to be people that want to enjoy it? Well, I would say, first of all, the the reception the demand the interest has been really phenomenal not just in the us where you would expect it but but certainly in the uk and in europe and australia um i i mean i think it's fair to say that china is a less china and asia generally are a less developed market for american whiskey but i think the other thing to remember is that what we do is just so tiny. And when you talk about the multiple Scotch brands that that have, I think we're up to 81 or 82 is the oldest Scotch whiskey so far. Um, every one of those brands that's releasing those super ultra aged whiskeys has a catalogue of younger mass brands that are supporting the, the work they do in the sort of ultra premium space. And We've never done that because we've never done anything except what we do. And what we're seeing now, I think over the last few years, is, is a sort of an understanding of what we're trying to do, which is to do one thing really well in a number of categories. And that because we're tiny and because our, you know, our sort of motto, if you like, is is the fact that it's the last drop that nothing we do would ever be repeated there isn't there isn't a tap i can turn on and say oh we've just got some more of this 500 bottles or 1500 bottles 
And what we're seeing, and I think this was always the ambition of the brand, was that we want people to be open-minded about what they drink. So that if you're a Scotch drinker, don't just drink Scotch. Discover along with us cognac, bourbon, rum, and and really fascinating things like port or, or Pinot de Charente, which is something from the, the cognac region of France. And uh, sort of look on us, if you like, as, as your your friend and it's like if a friend recommends a book you're going to give it a, a chance aren't you because you like your friend and you like you've read things that they enjoyed before and I think it's that sort of trusted advisor part of our role that that really matters here which is we're saying we promise you if we've put it in a bottle it's going to be good and it's an opportunity for you to discover something you might not know you liked and certainly when Drew and I did some tastings over here in the UK, the reception from both committed bourbon aficionados and from people who not really tasted bourbon before was equally enthusiastic and positive because of this lovely, this sense of trust. I suppose that that's the word. And because what we do is so small, we've built up really fantastic relationships with a lot of our customers because they are on the journey with us, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I'd just add to that. My my mission is really, I think, for everybody to gain some appreciation for what we do here and the quality of the product around the world, if yeah. possible. So that's not just Kentucky Straight Bourbon, but the art of blending. Mm. Um, and also the education process that it doesn't have to be 80 years old to be good. No. You know, we have a different environment here. Uh, it's hot. We use new barrels. We have a different product. So it's unfair to compare the two aging yeah. 50, even though we're experimenting with aging longer in different various um, ways. Um, my mission, I think now at this stage of my career is to show people how good these products can be. Um, the way they are. And I think this is a good example of uh, how we can do that, how we can start to do that. Yeah. I, th I think it's also very, it's super timely for it to involve Buffalo trace, which is as Jake and I know the, the most popular Kentucky bourbon distillery right now. Like it, it's hard to find Buffalo trace products period. And, you know, as we see Kentucky whiskeys just getting more and more and more popular, I think this is a super timely release to just highlight both of those things and to not even just stick with Kentucky bourbon. Like we were talking about earlier, this is, this is three different recipes. Yep. Right. So yeah, I think exactly. it's super timely and it's very interesting. You know, when, when I read about the last drop, uh, obviously I've, I've read a few press releases about the last drop and it's just like, how are they doing this? But it's it's the brain trust that you're developing and the assembly mm -hmm. uh, that you guys have created to have those people that identify where the special whiskeys, where the special you know liquid is, rum and every cognac and everything, uh, and then to put it in a bottle. I think it's I think it's great. Yeah. So my ambition for 2023 is to actually get all six of them together in one place. We've never managed that because obviously this all started during the pandemic, but it is it's my heartfelt ambition to actually put these these people in a room together. That's going to be a lot of whiskey knowledge. Say is that I got this little book that comes with this product. It's a little green book and look at this little page with a picture of me which is <laughs> You so that's my favorite picture because I always say the sun is always <laughs> shining wherever Drew is. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Glamour <man>. shots. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Actually, when when we were developing this, I had no idea she wanted to put my name on, you know, with my <laughs> signature. So that was a big surprise. Well, it it's definitely, you know, signature worthy. It's a uh, signature uh, pour and bottle that, you know, if this is something that you can't afford, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the the person to give the stamp of approval or Scott is, but we both approve it. Like it's, it's really good. Drew 
you could feel that your heart was in it. Like that's the most important yeah. thing about whiskey making. And, and Rebecca, as, as, as the person being the cheerleader and the captain behind the scenes, um, you know, the story you all are telling is, is beautiful. And I think that's what get lost and gets lost in, in the whiskey community is, is there's a lot of beauty behind blending and bringing forth a product, um, no matter the space, uh, for people to enjoy. So we really appreciate you all joining us today to celebrate our 200th episode. Thank you. Well, for I'm just us. Like, yeah. And many congratulations on 200 Thanks. episodes. That's a, that's a significant milestone. Many Thank congratulations. You. And here's, Here's a big cheer out to you guys. And thank you for having us. It's been lovely. Well, we really appreciate it. Um, and for our listeners, uh, if you all want to know more about The Last Drop, pretty simple. Just go over to Instagram, <laughs> at The Last Drop Distillers. Uh, you can find out more about them there. Uh, you can find out more about the Sazerac portfolio. Just Google Sazerac. There's all types of stuff that will show up. Um, and if you want to find out more about Buffalo Trace, pretty simple, at Buffalo Trace. Uh, go, go to their website or, or Instagram. Find out more there. And until next time, Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.